and we are morning. delighted that so many people have been able to join us online for what we hope will be an interesting and a thought-provoking morning. Uh, for us in Tusla, and I know for others that have been involved in the Manuela project, it's particularly good to finally be here, uh, given that we had to let go of our originally original celebratory plans to mark the concluding of the project back in April, and I know we weren't alone in these times with disruption and uncertainty being the new normal, but it's, it's great to be here finally. Um, it's just about this time three years ago when the serious work to shape a funding proposal into a living, breathing project began, when TUSA was notified that we had been successful in securing funding through the EU Justice Funding Programme. Uh, there are definitely a few more, more than a few moments of be careful what you wish for with this. Um, but what became the Manuela Project began life as the Manuela Programme, um, a, a collaborative effort supported by the Manuela Riedo Foundation Ireland to draw together an evidence-based programme around sexual consent that drew on the collective wisdom and years of experience of the 16 Rape Crisis Centres and Rape Crisis Network Ireland, both their experience in supporting victims of sexual violence and around the dynamics of sexual violence and the body of preventative education work that the organisations had undertaken. TUSA's role really has been to support and enable a body of work to take place that built on the experience of the RCC sector. Um, and so today I and my colleagues in the TUSA Domestic Sexual and Gender-Based Violence Services team and, other, and wider TUSA want to share a little about the, the background, the experience and the learning from the project. In particular, we hope that we'll have left enough space to capture the feel of the experience for young people who participated in the programme and their school communities. The term collaborative is used and overused, but in this case, I think it, the project and the outcomes in so many ways reflect a body of work that no individual participant or stakeholder could have done alone and that nobody in particular owned, but where everybody involved had an important part of the picture. So I really hope if you have a good morning. Uh, without further ado, I'll call on the TUSA CEO, Mr. Bernard Gloucester, to introduce the session. Uh, Bernard, over the since he's come in, has placed domestic, sexual and gender-based violence services as, as a key priority for TUSA um, and has met with, with stakeholders in the sector. So uh, thanks and over to you, Bernard. Thanks very much, Joan, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's in strange times indeed that we uh, meet. We've now become more accustomed uh, to the use of technology, and thankfully we have that to bring us together. I, I know that prior to uh, COVID, which upended all of our worlds in so many different ways, uh, there was a plan uh, for Dublin Castle and for an event to mark the conclusion of the years of the Manuel project. Uh, thankfully, some months later, uh, we've got to the point uh, where today uh, the acknowledgement of the programme can take place, but more importantly, the learnings from that programme, the evidential-based learnings from that programme, uh, and how those learnings are going to inform future action and continuity in the whole area of consent and what that means. And that's a very broad canvas uh, to work on, as I'm sure many of you, the professionals on this call, uh, could talk to in much more and greater detail than I do. Uh, perhaps the deferral from earlier in the year of the event uh, to now arriving in October, um, uh, the, the, the significance uh, of the time of year uh, is not lost in me. Uh, I know that we approach the anniversary of the very tragic death of uh, Manuela Riedo, and I think it's very important at the outset to uh, to recognise that and to 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 recognise what what that event meant for people uh, in Irish society at the time. Annie and all of us uh, who weren't even working in this sector at the time uh, can can recall the response and the reaction uh, across society to the news reports of the dreadful events that led to the very sad and tragic and untimely death uh, of, of what by, by all and any accounts is a wonderful young person. Uh, and the, the Manuela project itself, uh, so many years on from that, is not just testament and living testament to her memory uh, and, and, and to bringing into reality and focus what society needs to learn and to do to improve from those events. But it shows the immense generosity uh, her family uh, in in allowing her name to 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 be the name of the foundation which supported this project and indeed 
uh, is is generally supportive uh, of of raising awareness uh, in so many ways. So I certainly don't want to let today go uh, without remembering where the name came from and the the importance of that name. Uh, today. Uh, you are, are going to hear about the Manuela project, about some 30 months of work uh, across a large number of schools and youth organisations, almost 70 uh, that participated with so many young people. Uh, not only is that a very good footprint uh, on which a project of this type could work in terms of reaching people, but the particular model and style of the programme from what I've read uh, has all the basis uh, of becoming something that essentially can grow uh, and grow in a very organic way and in as much as it has leadership from the top down from so many organizations uh, it does appear uh, to produce not only the evidence uh, but the inspiration for it to be somewhat infectious to come from the ground up uh, because of the way and the style and the methodology uh, in which the program was delivered uh, any program uh, any project uh, does have a lifespan, and this had a lifespan of uh, just over over three years, and it, it achieved so many things. Uh, however, as, as you will hear later on today, uh, what's particularly heartening about this program was the willingness of the partners to take that additional step and to subject that program to independent research and to subject it to critique. And the work of Patrick McNeila and Marley Keith, um, I think it's very significant in that regard, and you're going to hear more about that. I'm very fortunate, uh, I think, to be in a position of a CEO of a public service body that has an interest in protection, that has an interest in children and young, and sexual based violence, uh, to, to, to be able to look at this through so many lenses. And the briefings that I've received are certainly very uh, encouraging in all of those lenses. When I look, when I look at the work and when I look at the attempt uh, of what of what the work set out to do at the start, firstly, I think universally about young people, and I think universally about young people in terms of education and education as a form of not just prevention of something bad, but a form of development of something that's good. And the engagement of young people, from what I can see from this project and from the evidence. Uh, that Podrick and Maureen uh, have, have elicited would, would seem to suggest to me um, that, that talking about prevention of something harmful is so, so important. Having, having the ability to reflect on and talk about how important it is uh, that that prevention happens at the right stage and at the right stage of a young person's development uh, is, is significant. When I look at it from the perspective of the response to domestic and sexual gender-based violence, in particular, in this case, sexual violence, we, we have seen emerge during COVID-19 again, a very healthy debate in Irish society uh, about consideration uh, of vulnerability and about consideration of issues uh, around violence and around sexual violence. And those are very hard conversations for society to have because all of us have an emotional response uh, to those types of events and incidents uh, when they go on because perhaps there is a part of us that would, would prefer not to think that that's in our world, that that's around us and that that's part of us. And yet uh, any, any intervention to respond not only to victims but to prevent more victims and, and to, to reduce the level of offence requires the debate to be had. It requires the debate to be had at, at so many levels. And recently, you many people will have seen another angle on that debate in the focus again, uh, of renewed focus, particularly on the issue of consent in the third level sector and the newly established Department of Higher Education and the commitment of Minister Harris uh, to, to challenge third level institutions and all that work in them and live in them and use them to consider very carefully uh, its, 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 its conversation and its efforts uh, to, to respond to so many issues that, that come from us. So, so it is a very wide uh, ranging topic, the one of when we come to consent, but I'm absolutely uh, convinced as I am indeed in the case of of, of, of harm reduction and, and issues associated with addiction and drugs and, and other things, and indeed other forms of crime, uh, that, that education 
uh, is so important. I was making the comment just before the webinar started to, uh, to a member of the NCCA, um, uh, the National Curriculum, how, how important it is that we try to reach young people through the various relationships that they already have, and none so, none so are more important outside of the family than the relationships that are established in education or informal youth programs or youth education programs or youth training programs or youth clubs and sports clubs. And children, when they go into those arrangements, they have to some degree uh, a constructive but also a natural relationship with the teacher, with the mentor, with the adult, with the person, with the role model. And so through that, uh, I've certainly seen in the past very positive examples uh, of, of where people working in the education and the youth response sectors put themselves forward to be facilitators of particular programs and in this case in, in, the, in the Manuela program and to translate that into in as much as possible the already packed agenda of, of, of the curriculum in school. There are now so many subject matters uh, becoming alive in society and all becoming a priority all with their own advocates that, that, that they're competing almost for that space and we know of course that children and young people have so much headspace and we know uh, that the teachers have, have only so much time. I, I don't think anyone would dispute uh, that issues of education and education around, around the area, particularly of consent, attitudes to the mythology uh, that traditionally surrounds rape and sexual assault and sexual offences, attitudes to sexuality, to sexual relationships, uh, they, they, they are all they are all now features uh, of, of, of life in which young people need to be part of the conversation and they need to be part of the positive influence that so many can give them through education and through hearing their views. Little, little did we think 10, 15 and 20 years ago of what the prevalence of where young people get their influences from. Uh, would be in the form now of social media and social media gets a very, very bad press uh, from time and yet we all know it has served us all uh, extremely well uh, in so many other ways. But like all of the good things and the good technological advances in society and indeed the societal advances, there always comes, of course, uh, the space and the place for the danger and for the negative to emerge within that and to find a place within that. Supporting young people to be informed, supporting young people to develop attitudes and supporting young people uh, to, to, to develop responsible attitudes uh, towards others in, in whatever their relationships are is so critically important. It's very evident in the nature of the evaluation of the Manuela project that so much has been achieved and it's very evident that people liked the programme that people bought into the programme and therefore, of course, its chance of having a lasting impact becomes even greater because it wasn't, it wasn't perhaps, uh, you know, viewed in some, in some of the other uh, forms of learning that can happen where we go, someone teaches, we learn, we demonstrate, we've learned, we do an exam or we do uh, some form of project and then we leave it behind us and we move on and we often think, well, wasn't that wonderful? And then life moves on. It, the particular type uh, of approach uh, that was adopted here uh, was one that was very significantly formed on the person, on the human person, on relationships, on attitudes, and what the consequences of attitudes in relationships can be, both in the very positive and, of course, in, in, in the very negative. And that's why I go back to the point uh, that this was not only an intervention, uh, that had the intention of prevention through education, but, but actually also of replacing what you're seeking to prevent with, with, with what is known to be better uh, in the context of relationships and how young people support them. Unique also to this project, of course, uh, is uh, that this wasn't a state-led or a single agency-led project, and it's extremely important, again, that that's the case. Uh, TUSLA is one, but one uh, state agency. Uh, and there are so many agencies and organisations that are so critical to and relevant to this type of work. And in this case, the partnership 
uh, with the rape crisis centres and Galway as a lead partner for very obvious reasons in terms of the origins of the project. But the Rape Crisis Network of Ireland, the support of rape crisis centres, be that in Kerry or be that in places, the support of the NCCA in, in, in terms of, you know, taking that very broad demand uh, for place on the curriculum and giving this attention support. And uh, the support of the EU, the support of the Manuela Foundation, and the, the privilege for TUSLA uh, to have been a small part in supporting that. And I would want uh, TUSLA to be a part of, to have been a part of, and certainly to be a part of the future uh, of what, you know, putting our money where our mouth is uh, in relation to advancing this. But being very clear, uh, this is neither the sole remiss of nor should it be the sole remit of any one agency, be that Tusla or anybody else. Uh, this really is a whole of society uh, response issue. And it is more than a whole of society conversation. The conversation must lead to something. And that conversation uh, appears to me to need to lead in part to uh, what has happened in this programme and, and the way it was delivered. There are other parts of society's response that all, also need to be dealt with dealing with victims dealing with and supporting victims of sexual violence in the courts and the recent seminal work of Tom O'Malley uh, is, 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 is of great importance in that and, and so many others. And of course we can't forget the many service providers who like so many social services in Ireland grew up out of voluntarism, grew up out of altruism, grew up out of local initiative and in this case I do certainly want to pay tribute to the 16 rape crisis centres across Ireland that we're so privileged to partner with um, and, and the enormous work they do uh, because it, part, part of their response to supporting victims also generates a basis of information and evidence about part of what it is uh, that isn't working or that has to be addressed and that's what feeds back into uh, education and development programmes uh, such as this. Uh, I want to uh, pay, pay particular thanks, if I can, to the Galway Rape Crisis Centre and, and their partners in Kerry and Wexford and Dublin Rape Crisis Centre and they, all their offices for the support uh, and the guidance that they uh, gave during this. So I want to thank my colleagues in the HSE, uh, particularly the Sexual Health and Crisis Pregnancy Programme, which I'm very familiar with, at the Department of Justice and Equality and the Department of Education, lead departments in the lives of both children and in, in response to crime. Um, all, all of the partners across the network, to my own uh, staff, both in the TUSLA Education Support Service, you know that is the Education Welfare Service, uh, to the Manuela uh, Riedo Foundation uh, in Ireland, and, and I suppose in particular the, the team in our own DSGPV sector with Joan, and particular credit to um, Mary Roach and Suzanne Walker uh, and Anne Ryan. Consent is a very complex uh, issue, and uh, I don't, I don't, I, I don't for a moment claim uh, to believe that any of us, as adults or as organisations, uh, can say uh, that we have it worked out. We have it all worked out. Uh, it's, it's, it's an evolving concept uh, that has so many strands to it, and pulling those strands and following them. Uh, is critically important. Why is it important? It's important for everybody in terms of healthy relationships. It's important for all of us as to how we live with our fellow citizens. It's particularly important in the context of relationships and it's particularly important in the context of how young people form their attitudes to relationships, how they form their attitudes to each other, how they form their attitudes to sex and to sexuality, and how they then live out those attitudes in their behaviours and in their relationships and in their actions on into adult life, which of course will in turn come to influence uh, the next generation that comes after them. As I say, it, this is more than one could say a pilot, and I think it's very, very important uh, to, to reference that. The volume that was involved in this is a substantial volume. Uh, I'm sure the researchers uh, will, will point you to that fact again better than I can. It's a very substantial volume, it's a very substantial footprint and the conclusions that can be drawn from it, uh, they can be considered to be well-grounded conclusions. So we go from a project which of itself is a very good thing, 
we go from people's views about the project, which are always a very good thing and a good way to learn. And then we go into sound evaluation that's independently researched and independently validated uh, and is done using baseline methodology and, and other things. And so all of that brings us then to the next phase. I know that there's an application with the EU for another round uh, of a program similar uh, to this, if you like to take it to its next place, to take it to its next phase of life. And I hope that that will be very successful. Uh, we, 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 we can't, um, I think, claim full uh, positivity on a jet, but the, the, the indicators from what I'm told are very good. So I can see, uh, to use that phrase from the economy, I can see green shoots uh, in that. But I do want to be very clear. Whether we get X hundred thousand from an EU source or not, it is incumbent on all of us. It is incumbent on all of us, and certainly on those of us who are state agencies and government departments. It is incumbent on all of us to take the benefits, the learning, and the real evidence that you see today, and to integrate that into our normal business and our normal work, wherever we engage young people wherever we engage the debate about consent and to give action and to give focus to that. Uh, and I, for my part, want to be clear, I see that as much a critical part of the HSE's uh, response and role, both for children and child welfare, but also for domestic and sexual gender-based violence. I see that as much a part of our role as any. Uh, very often, it's easy to default to the front line and the emergency response and not take the time to go back to the real change, to the prevention space and to, to the earlier intervention. And all of the indications here are we need to even go below uh, the transition year level uh, to start uh, to make further positive constructs. So with that, I hope you have a very successful webinar this morning. Uh, I hope those of you who are involved in the project feel a sense of and share in a sense of success. Uh, because this might not be the front page of tomorrow's Irish Times. But the front page of tomorrow's Irish Times, with the news cycle the way it is, will be forgotten the day after. This really is probably much more about the front page of young people and young people's lives and their development and our responsibility to them as adults. And that lasts a lot, much longer than tomorrow. So I hope you share in a success about what has been achieved. I hope we remain open to what could be better as we go forward. And I hope we make that better. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard, for that. And um, I know Bernard has to go for another appointment shortly. So I appreciate your time being here this morning with us. Um, I suppose with the context for the project framed and, and set out, we're moving on now to hear about and learn a bit more about the project, project and the outcomes. So it's with huge pleasure that I call on my colleague Mary Roach to lead us through the background of the project, share a little about how the project evolved and unfolded and give us a snapshot of what was achieved. Um, there are many people to be thanked and recognised to contribute to the success of the project. Um, but anyone who's been involved appreciates the pivotal role that Mary has played in shaping the vision for the project and being the glue, I suppose, that held it together at particular times and across the many phases of the project um, and who supported everybody um, with, with patience and kindness and tenacity and whatever and energy. So, Mary, um, over to you now. Thanks, Joan. Uh, I appreciate that very generous welcome. Um, well, I'm Mary, uh, Mary Roach, and I work with Tusla as a Senior Coordinator for Sexual Violence Services. And I, I'm here, as Joan said, to give an overview of the project, um, how we went about it, who was involved, what happened and when. Um, I hope this isn't too much talking for all of you, but um, uh, the 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 important thing is is when we move on after me is to hear the findings of the project. But there was a lot of the findings of the evaluation in the project. But anyway, um, back to two thousand and nine, uh, when the Manuela Foundation was set up, and both Joan and Bernard have referenced this. 
Um, but it was in response to the awful tragedy of Manuela Riedo's death. She was a Swiss student on an exchange program who was raped and murdered two years previously. Um, the foundation then, the Manuela Foundation, which was set up in her honour, has been active over the last 10 years, uh, the 10 years since then, in funding professional agencies working in the area of prevention, awareness, education and healing of sexual assault and rape. But after years of the foundation organising probably things like fundraisers, concerts, events, flag days, uh, it was keen to get something lasting in place and it invited the Rape Crisis Centres, all 16 of them, along with the Rape Crisis Network Ireland, to come together and to share the best of their training and educational materials. Out of this collaboration then came the programme itself, the Manuela programme, and it was a consent uh, a preventative consent information and education program. It was coordinated by Dr. Sue Redmond. It was an evidence informed program in that it drew from an international body of research and it had well defined theoretical or pedagogical background. It had detailed content and a range of interactive delivery strategies. And it was designed to be delivered to the age group of 15 to 17 year olds, um, probably mainly destined for schools and to be done in six to our sessions, focusing on attitudes, awareness, critical thinking and skills relevant to sexual violence prevention and relevant to the promotion of active consent. Also suitable for alternative and other community based settings. But with the young audience in mind, it had to be, it was designed to be very interactive. Given the current focus on the problems around sexual consent following, you know, things like the Harvey Weinstein revelations, the high profile cases, the Me Too campaign, it's hard to believe that at this time, it was an area that had not yet received widespread attention and certainly not in schools. So moving on then to 2016, two things happened next. Out of the blue, the Department of Justice sent information about a restricted EU funding call for educational approaches to violence against women. Um, by restricted, I mean it had to be responded to by a government department or a government agency. At the same time, um, Galway Rape Crisis Centre were advocating for the Manuela programme to be supported by TUSLA. Um, their, closeness, their closeness to the Manuela Foundation um, led Cathy Connolly, their, uh, their, their manager, and Michelle Caulfield, uh, one of their therapists, and Owen Durkin from the Foundation, all of whom you'll hear from later, to treat Anne Ryan and myself to an impressive and passionate presentation on the collaborative process to date. Uh, in case you're wondering where TUSLA fits into all of this, just a small word to those of you that may not know our work terribly well. In addition to uh, its work and responsibilities in relation to child protection and family support, uh, TUSLA has responsibility um, to those individuals who experience domestic and or sexual or gender based violence. And the DSGBV team, that's the short for all those domestic, sexual and gender based violence, uh, the team, uh, which numbers about 10, uh, is led by Joan Mullen, our MC for today. Uh, that team bid for and secured EU funding uh, to conduct an extended pilot rollout and evaluation of the Ma Manuela programme. So here is our chance to see does this work and can we put uh, concentrated money, concentrated effort uh, to, to rolling it out to as many schools and students as possible? The overall aim was to engage students in transition year and in some out of school settings to assess the evidence of the programme impact and to support capacity for the work in the education sector. The project officially commenced in September 2017. And uh, what you may not know is that EU projects are necessarily bureaucratic in nature and have a very fixed timeline. The clock starts ticking on the budget as soon as the project starts, the project start date. And it, and it did so on the 3rd of September and for the next 30 months. It, within that time frame, everything had to be delivered and evaluated. So there was no hanging around. Now, a huge amount of preliminary planning work was completed to assure that the project team hit the ground running. The structure that was set up, as Bernard explained, involved Galway as the beneficial partner. 
Um, being a beneficial partner means that you're enabled to receive a funding stream for the project. You have to administrate that funding stream as well. So it comes at a heavy price, let me tell you. The other three rape crisis centres, Kerry, um, led by Vera O'Leary, Wexford, uh, led by Claire Williams, whom you may hear from later, and Dublin, led by Nolene Blackwell. They came on board as associate partners and they agreed, along with Galway, to host the project workers that were going to be assigned to the four geographical areas and to share their own expertise and to support them locally. We were joined then by an advisory group, um, a, a group of key stakeholders, and they included, again, I think um, some of the, the principal um, stakeholders have been name-checked already, but I'm going to do it again if that's okay. Orla McGowan and Moira Germain from HSE's Sexual Health and Crisis Pregnancy Programme. They brought a wealth of experience of dealing with sexual education programmes already and their relationship with the Department of Education. Um, two other rape crisis centres led by Grace McCardle, that was the rape crisis uh, northeast, and Natasha O'Keefe from the Tipperary Rape Crisis Centre joined the group, the advisory group. Um, Dr. Cleena Sadler, Rape Crisis Network Ireland, was there to ask the hard questions and to bring her huge expertise. Um, Leonie O'Dowd from the training centre in the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre joined that group and representatives from the Department of Education and Skills, including Olive O'Neill, and the Department of Justice and Equality, Pat Carey, Ross Wynne, um, and there might have been one or two others from those departments that I'm omitting the names of here. Um, but they were uh, the, the core group who, who were very active as a, an advisory group. Sometimes advisory groups are there, maybe maybe they don't have that much to do. This one had a lot to do, met regularly, um, asked all the questions that needed to be asked, uh, uh, and so on. But on the ground then, what had to happen? So the project were, the project staff had to be pulled together. So four project workers were recruited and they were located in Galway. That was Michelle Caulfield. Christy McFetteridge was located in the Kerry Rape Crisis Centre. Carolyn Brohan in Wexford and Kevin McParland in the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. And you will meet Kevin and Michelle in a wee while. Project administration then was shared between Galway and Thusla and Amanda Cosgrove was the Galway link on this front and uh, in Thusla, Laura, Rachel and Deirdre successively filled the role. Anne Ryan from my team initially acted as project manager until Suzanne Walker, uh, the permanent uh, uh, pro or the, the project manager was recruited. With the exception of Suzanne, all other project team members were part time. The project workers then trained up with the materials. They wouldn't have known the materials before, except for one of them, Would, wouldn't have known the materials necessarily before coming on board as the project workers. So they, they got familiar with the program manuals. Uh, they delivered the first two programs in pairs, and this ensured program fidelity and enabled them to share their knowledge and their approaches so that roughly the same thing was happening as each program was delivered to young people thereafter. Their immediate task, of course, was to recruit schools through cold calling, using the networks and supports of the rape crisis centres. They found schools in their respective areas. Consent protocols had to be arranged in schools where principals were supportive and which had policies of their own. It was much easier job. But timetabling a six two hour session in a school, which doesn't lend itself to two hour slots, is no mean feat, it's very challenging. It involved numerous calls, it involved enormous flexibility. Last minute changes were about to happen. In some situations, a whole class would have been gone to maybe the plowing championships or gone on work experience. Welcome to the chaos that is transition year. We got an insight into the load that teachers cope with, into their nightmares. But the programme was rolled out in a particularly interesting way in order to support the, the development of capacity within the ed education sector. Initially, the project worker uh, led the facilitated six sessions with the teacher there to, to, uh, in a co-role, but um, in, in a support role. The second time that this programme was run in that school, the teacher then took the lead facilitation role with the project worker supporting them. And the third time, 
This was the overall design. The third time the teacher was um, enabled to run the program alone uh, with distance support of, of, the project, uh, of the project team. The, the, the approach for the, the, the whole delivery was that of an empowerment approach. It was an equal uh, setting uh, where, where the issues were debated and shared, uh, very interactive, lots of interesting pieces of film uh, like Lucy's Party, which was developed in, in, in Galway as well, in the Galway Drama um, Department, along with the Manuela Foundation. Um, pieces of important clips, uh, uh, interactive clips were included uh, in, in the programme. Lively debate and argument was the purpose. By the end of the 2018 academic year, so this was the first year that the programme was rolled out, um, school holidays arrived, uh, but not for the project workers. Um, the, the Manuela programme was revamped during the, the, the summer period and the learning from the initial year had to be shared. This was an important milestone because this was the programme that was finally going to be evaluated and tested to see if it worked. Um, an evaluation steering group, which was the whole work around this, was initiated in 2017. But a steering group, uh, including Noel Kelly, who heads up the Tusla Education Support Services, and Bern Bernard Barrett from the Tusla Research Department, were key members. And initially, we invited some specialist advice from Dr. Orla, Orla Doyle, who is an associate professor uh, in UCD. And they all advised on setting out the tender process for the evaluation piece to begin within the project. It was a key requirement of the project. Um, now, just to say that it's easy to underestimate the time that it takes to see a tender process through. So we learned the hard way. NUI Galway's psych psychology department was awarded the project evaluation co uh, a contract um, and Dr. Podrick Mountneela was the lead uh, investigator. They were on it immediately. Their task was, in some sort of just in plain English, was to find out, does the program work? Is it acceptable? And is it sustainable? Ethical approval had to happen first. So permission protocols were developed um, and the pre and post delivery survey instruments were designed. Um, it was, it's very important also that the rape crisis centres locally, and this is part of the ethical application, uh, that the rape crisis centres services would be available to provide services to support students um, who might along the way in the course of, of receiving the consent education might disclose instances of sexual violence for themselves. So those kind of careful management of students and indeed teachers in the process had to be had to be looked after. The evaluation process then began in October 2018. The project workers role at this point suddenly becomes much more complex. They have to manage the evaluation permissions protocols from schools, from students and from their parents and there was double signing involved in that all the way along. Um, they had to support the administration of the pre and the post surveys for all participants. So the survey instrument, which was going to tell us whether anything had changed between the beginning of the engagement with students uh, and the end, uh, are, the, are, the, are those instruments. Maureen Diaz super, supervised this aspect of the project with the project workers. With the new emphasis on consent and uh, positive reports spreading from school to school, new schools were coming on board. People were interested. They, they started wanting to have the Manuela program introduced into their school. Some schools were asking for more rollouts, trying to get full coverage for their whole transition year, for example. And there were youth reach sites coming on board. It's a busy time for the project. Behind the scenes then, the project timing meant that a submission to the RSE review, that's the Relationships and Sexuality Education Review, which was being conducted um, at the behest of the Minister for Education by the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, that's the NCCA. Um, and submissions to that review were possible. And we got to know Annette, the work of Annette Honan and Paul Knox, who were doing that review. 
and uh, they continued to be constructive champions to the to the project from there on. There was an interim report to the EU that had to be furnished. By 2019, then, the whole project is rapidly gathering pace. The academic years continue. We got a sense of this kind of endless cycle of academic years happening. During school holidays, an additional one day training for teachers was held in four sites and all of that had to be planned in, it had to be set up, it had to be trained for. The education centres were very extremely helpful in enabling this to happen. The first interim findings from the evaluation started to come through and they were looking positive. There's now a waiting list uh, for of schools waiting to have the, um, the, the, the Manuela programme delivered to their students. And the waiting list ends up at about 30. Um, project staff uh, are asked to present at conferences, at meetings, to contribute articles. The work that the project staff managed, managed to get through should really not be underestimated. The opportunity to do some training with colleagues in Pave Point uh, was planned in and implemented. And it was to be a preliminary tester to see if this kind of education would be suitable and useful um, in, in, with ethnic minorities and with travellers specifically. Back in the office, uh, the advisory group and the project manager were keeping an eye on their EU responsibilities. These are onerous. Serves as rights as you. It's nice to see Tusla at the, at the other end of uh, inquiries from 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 funders uh, more usually the shoe was on the other foot but to be fair eu projects are really they're not for the faint-hearted and i think many of us uh, found out the hard way it's now coming up to 2020 uh, we're coming to the end of the project it's finishing on the 4th of March at this point. Um, so we're right up until the end. Uh, the delivery is going on in schools. Every last ounce was squeezed out of the project and the project workers, and we had fantastic project workers. But overall, the project, and you've heard this already, but it's no harm in saying it again. Overall, overall the project resulted in 2,700 young people, 52% of them uh, female, participated. Uh, in, in the project and received the learning and the consent uh, program. Uh, it reached 70 educational centres, 63 of them schools, seven of them youth reach centres, and 61 teachers and facilitators received comprehensive training. And they are a core group that remains now within the system that we hope to build on and 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 to use in a kind of a, a in informative way to to continue to build capacity. Um, the Manuela Programme Handbook was revised and updated. Evidence and learning from the project was used to inform national policy through the public submissions that we made. And uh, by this time, we were coming to the end of a complex, thorough and independent evaluation. And a research report was due very soon. And you'll hear all about that shortly and about its findings. A final report to the EU had to be prepared and Suzanne uh, did all the heavy lifting on that. The project learning is slightly different to the evaluation findings and I just want to mention a couple of things here in my concluding um, statements or comments. Um, there was, uh, the project came back uh, to share its learning with the wider rape crisis sector in the end. And uh, the on it should be said that ownership of, that of the programme manual and of the programme remains with the sector. It remains with the 16 rape crisis centres and or CNI. Um, training and programme or updates needed to be shared back. So any changes that have been made in the programme along the course of the project um, we wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of those and and uh, and we used the opportunity for the project workers to share everything they learned in the course of their education um, of, of young people. And training, as I said, for key staff in Pave Point as a first step to support an adapted consent programme happened. But back to the project learning, um, here's what we found out. Young people are very receptive 
they're very well able for this kind of education and consent. Transition year students believed that the program should be given to younger students. That was their own thinking. Um, and that was probably out of concern for what younger student group, younger age groups are dealing with. They felt that by the time they were getting this consent education, it was a little too late. Uh, consent materials need continuous updating to stay fresh and to stay relevant. It goes out of date very quickly when you're working with, with, with young people. And also with media developments and social media issues, uh, sexting, um, pornography, and everything that happens through those media. Uh, you need to be on top of this. The work is very difficult, our project workers discovered. It's really quite tricky. It requires significant training and it requires a lot of support. And if we expect that teachers should be able to do this, that needs to go with it. Young people need to be minded in the process. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, the nature of the subject material and the age of the participants, 14 to 17, requires considerable sensitivity in programme delivery. Partnership and collaboration is really important and can be used strategically. The need for consent education is now widely recognised. The doors really are open now. The project was designed as a resource intensive one, and this was deliberate. However, for consent education to become a universal part of good quality sexuality education, which we believe is a necessity and a right for young people, it has to be embedded in the curriculum and in the educational system to make it sustainable. With support and training, teachers are up for it. Schools see the point of it. We all see the point of doing prevention work. There ha really has been a very positive response from schools. Finally, uh, and this is, is my, 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 my final statement, the learning for us was that prevention work is hugely important and it needs to continue. Uh, and we are really, we will be very happy if we, are, if we succeed in getting another project possibility. I could go on, but I hope I gave you a flavour of the project. Thank you for listening. And should you have any comments or questions, uh, we will be available for a question and answer session after this. Um, and I think your Vimeo link allows this to happen. Thank you very much. Over to you, Joan. Thanks, Mary. And thanks for, for that um, overview of the project. And it's now time to hear directly from those most closely involved with the project. Um, as uh, the, the project structure has been described, um, and I think the the role of the, the alleged role of the, the project workers, but the, anybody who's been close to the project really um, understands that the, the role of the project, the, the contribution of the project workers went far beyond the, what, if you like, what, this, what was set out in, in any notional um, job description or role description. Um, so the, the project workers established huge credibility, they went above and beyond the call of duty and their commitment and their infectious enthusiasm. And uh, they really are central to the, to the successful outcomes that were reported for and by the young people who participated. Um, so the, the next section um, involves two of the project workers, um, Kevin McParland, who was based in the Dublin Ray Crisis Centre and Michelle Caulfield, who was based in Galway. Um, and we also have a chance to hear from the, the voice of teacher and students involved in the programme. So the, this is done as, as a series of, of videos. So we'll just run through that um, uh, just and, and I think hopefully give you some sense of, of you know, what, what this was like. So um, over to the videos now. Good morning, everyone. And it's wonderful to be with you this morning as we I think it's not inappropriate to say celebrate the launch of the Manuela Project Evaluation. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kevin, Kevin McParland, and I was the Manuela Project Officer um, based out of the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre for the duration of the pilot of the Manuela Programme. And I guess 
for the next five minutes or so, I'd just like to, you know, recount and talk a little about my experiences of delivering the program, some of the learnings, I guess, that came about from my own perspective of having worked with parents, teachers and students in the delivery of the project and really what it can maybe suggest to us when it comes to bringing a comprehensive sex education program forward in Ireland into the future. Um, I guess to begin with one of the most important things to do is to acknowledge that this program would not have been possible without the dedication and ongoing commitment of numerous stakeholders who were involved in the program and from that I want to at the outset acknowledge the support and work that was done by Anne Ryan, by Suzanne Walker and by Mary Roach and Tusla and I know that um, my colleague Michelle will be speaking about the support that the four project workers in the programme received from the Rape Crisis Network and the four Rape Crisis Centres where we were based. But from a personal point of view, I want to acknowledge in particular um, Leonie O'Dowd, who was the Education and Training Manager in the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, who was a wonderful support and a very inspiring mentor um, throughout the programme um, for me. And a big thanks also to all of the schools that we worked in and to all of the youth work settings and youth reach centres, particularly for myself working in Dublin, to the two youth reach centres in Ballymun and Cabra, who also took part in the programme and who contributed so much to the learnings that we find in the evaluation report today. So a big thanks to all of those schools and centres for that. And um, moving on, I think it's important also to reflect a little on the learning that we can derive from what has taken place over the past two and a half years. And to do that, I want to talk a little bit about the experience of being someone who facilitates the delivery of a sex education programme in Ireland. It is unfortunately still a relatively novel phenomenon, given that the sex education curriculum hasn't been updated since 1999 and the challenges that that poses in terms of presenting to schools, teachers, parents, and indeed young people themselves, um, a sex education programme that reflects the 21st century reality of the lives of young people. And one of the, I guess, phenomena that we were exploring and discussing in the programme was, for example, around pornography. And it's safe to say that the response that we received from teachers and students who participated in those sessions was overwhelmingly positive, and that didn't happen for no reason. The delivery of all of the sessions that we done was not ad hoc. It was founded and based on consistent practice that was led by international evidence in sexual violence prevention and sex education. It's important to recognise that in order to do that, the facilitators in delivering the programme and the teachers who accompanied us and who took part in our teacher training days demonstrated the significance and importance of being able to listen, to create an environment where young people can ask questions, to elicit conversations, to discover, to be beside young people in the learning over the course of the programme and to facilitate the knowledge that comes about through that and to critically reflect on the issues that they were encountering um, in contemporary society. It's safe to say that when we're talking about a 
issue like pornography that our own values, actions, social structures, all, I guess, inform what is taking place and how we interpret what is happening on our screens. And where is all, where other media we would offer to students and young people in schools a forum that they could critically evaluate the learning that is happening as a result of what they are consuming. It is imperative that we do the same around an issue like pornography. So I guess in conclusion, I will just say folks again that it's been wonderful to see such interest in the programme from all of the state institutions and stakeholders and individuals who are here today. And I very much hope that you will be the leaders in the next step that we take today and that the steps that the Manuela program has taken over the last two years are only the beginning of that journey and not the end. Thank you all very much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michelle Caulfield and I am talking to you this morning from the Galway Rape Crisis Centre. Um, I have been based um, in the Rape Crisis Centre doing education uh, for the last 10 years and I was the project worker for the Manuela program for the last three years. So it's, it's been an honour really to, to be part of this huge project with so many important stakeholders. Um, when Owen Durkin from the Manuel Laredo Foundation first approached us back in 2015, uh, we never dreamt it would come to this. So it's, um, it's been great and, and to be part of people who believe that we need to positively contribute to breaking Ireland's silence around sexual violence. Um, and the Manuela project was without doubt the best way to do it. So all four project workers based in, uh, Kevin was in Dublin, I'm in Galway, Christy was in Kerry and Carolyn was in Wexford. And our original concern about accessing our schools and our education system, principals, chaplains and teachers quickly diminished as the Manuela project hit the ground and we soon had the opposite problem in that we had far too many schools that wanted this program, um, which led to its own stress and uh, knowing we would probably not get to those schools and indeed we didn't. And um, yeah, because when you see it, when you see this program alive on the ground, I think my passion um, was reignited so much working with our students when you see how it changes and the, the emotional and the social education that comes with bringing them what's real and what's prevalent in their lives. Unfortunately, it is extremely prevalent in their lives. And as adults, uh, we need to take charge of that and we need to create an education that is real for them. So we know one million adolescents and children went back to school on this island last month. And one in four will have a negative sexual experience before they reach the age of 18. And nowhere is this gap of lack of education, both social, emotional and sexual, more prevalent than in Ireland's 16 rape crisis centres. Every day uh, we get the, the actual negative consequences of what can happen without education. And in simple terms of when you know better, you do better. When you know better, you will not be a bystander of this type of emotional and social abuse. So the, the Manuela program is uh, 10 to 12 hours content of really important and relevant subjects to these kids' lives. If nothing, at, at a very basic level, it creates an awareness. It names things that are happening in their lives. It gives them language around taboo subjects that are never talked about or discussed, like sexual violence and how to manage that in their lives when they are disclosed to or when their best friend has had a negative effect or episode. So it's clarifying consent, which needs to be clarified at 14 and 15 and 16 years of age. It's the, the giving the language so that they can take it somewhere else. Um, it's their harsh realities. It gives them options and it names the feelings that they process every day in this world and 21st century. It also takes the power away from the pornography industry 
um, unfortunately, where on average between 10 and 12 year olds are going for sex education. So that is relevant. It puts the power back in the hands of the educators, the teachers, the parents. Um, it's without doubt been one of the most effective um, and amazing experiences of my personal work life. Working, I think we trained over 62 teachers in the end um, to create this wonderful model that has layers and layers of learning. I think the most positive indicators of the program was parents. Um, you know, I, I obviously, as a project worker, worked in two of my own local secondary schools and we would have parents come to us. Teachers were telling us parents were actually calling the school hugely grateful that this was being done um, because parents simply don't have the skills and teachers need to be taught the skills and how to do this well. And that is what the Manuela program actually does. And really, really well. Finally, teachers had a roadmap and a context um, and a layered emotional approach on how to do this well and how to do it safely. And the training days, they would leave the education centres buzzing um, to think this this is why I trained as a teacher. This is real. Um, you know, there was several times where I was pre-warned about a particularly rambunctious classroom and say, you know, you're going to get talking and you're going to get um, immaturity and you're going to get different um, scenarios thrown at you um, that might be uncomfortable. And I have to say uh, that rarely happened. I would go as far as saying 97 percent of the time. The experience was so positive. They were so attentive. They were so on. Uh, we had a secret uh, question segment that we would roll out on every session. I have over a thousand questions um, from these kids who uh, were just amazingly responsive, excited and there, really there. Uh, there was very little problems um, in rolling out this in terms of what these kids wanted from us. I'm very uh, proud to say that the, the program is actually embedded um, in 10 different schools, including the Aran Islands, um, as we speak. That for me is huge. And I think every single adolescent in this country deserves that, deserves that kind of education and preventative education before they go out into the world. Uh, one of the learnings, I think, is, is for me personally, was this is actually needed at a much younger age. So 14, ideally, um, and we can certainly be doing other things before that. I'd also like to thank um, all four rape crisis centres, um, or CNI and all rape crisis centres believe strongly in education. But in particular, I'd like to thank Vera in Kerry, Claire in Wexford, and Dublin and Cathy and Galway, Nolene in Dublin and Cathy and Galway. I think without them, this absolutely wouldn't have happened. There was nowhere to base this type of new education. So um, absolutely key in, in getting us all um, on board and also TUSLA for, for helping us require that funding. And I think more than anything, my want and, and desire for this programme is that it continues to go forward and that we can embed it in all Irish schools, that every single child that went back to school last month will have that embedded in, in their, their school and in themselves, because it's a very personal type of education that is key to, to being and living in the world safely. Hi everyone, my name is Carolyn Brohan and I was the Manuela project worker in Wexford with the Wexford Rape Crisis Centre. I have to say this has been one of the best experiences I have had in my lifetime professionally, personally, being part of this pilot. The reason I wanted to do it is coming from a youth work background. I've worked about 21 years with young people and it's an area that has come up a lot. The question relationships, they question what's okay, they question what's acceptable behaviour or what they think is acceptable or what others expect them to do. So it's something that has always come up for me. And I absolutely relish the opportunity to become part of this project. I 
knew from the outset this was something I had to do and I've been so lucky and privileged to be part of it. I delivered it around County Wexford to a number of different areas, both rural and urban. And the biggest, biggest, biggest feedback we got was from the young people. How grateful they were for the opportunity to be part of a conversation around sexual violence, sexual violence prevention, awareness. They couldn't understand that certain behaviours that they may have been engaging in prior to having done the programme weren't okay or weren't acceptable. And the programme really shone a light on the whole area of sexual violence in a very sensitive but engaging way. And it also provided them the opportunity to speak about this conversation, to speak around these topics, which they all, a lot of students said, this never happened before. It doesn't come up. To have the opportunity to talk about pornography, I suppose the consequences for perpetrators too, they never thought about the consequences for somebody on the other side. So it really gave a balanced viewpoint and a whole exploration of the area in a very, very safe way. It has been one of the best things I've ever done to witness young people going on a journey. And I know that's a real saying, but to see where they start from and where they finish from, from having been part of the programme has been an absolute honour and privilege for me. I absolutely would love to see this continued somehow in schools, on the curriculum. In Wexford, four schools have taken it on board and in fairness to them are striving hard to maintain it there. So the ultimate goal would be that every school takes this on board in some way, shape or form and makes it part of the fabric of the curriculum because it is a vital and current conversation that we will always need to have with young people right now and going forward. So thank you everyone and thanks for taking the time to listen to me and take care. All the best. Hi, my name is Leanne Goff. I'm a guidance counsellor in Colossia Eamon Reach in Wexford. Um, and I was new to the school last year um, and had never heard of the Manuela programme before I started here. So for me, it was a new undertaking um, to be informed of the programme and also to deliver the programme um, as well. Okay, uh, so what was your personal undertaking of the experience in the Manuela programme? Um, I suppose for me, it was a completely different style of teaching or a different approach to teaching with regards to the content of the actual programme. So it's very different to anything that I had taught before. Um, and I suppose I was a little bit apprehensive initially because of the content. So it was important for me to inform myself of the content before I was able to deliver it. But I think the content and the delivery of the program itself is hugely beneficial for students. And it was really something that I gained a valuable insight into with regards to the boys and how they engage with the program as a result of the content. Um, and I, I was very, very surprised with their level of engagement and also the level of enthusiasm with regards to the programme for such a sensitive or, I suppose, a delicate topic that previously in, in Irish schools we may not have um, involved ourselves in or we may not have felt comfortable enough to be able to introduce it into the curriculum. Um, so. I learned a lot from the delivery as well as the students as well um, and I, I just found that it was fantastic and it opened up a lot of conversation um, and a lot of engagement and I think as well it's hugely beneficial in terms of bringing it back out into the community and encouraging students to talk about this at home and to make other people aware of you know the impact of social media that it, how it portrays men versus women and you know, even down as far as the wolf whistling and how they haven't perceived that as, you know, some sort of um, sexual harassment in the past. So even to see their their conversations during the lesson and also around the corridors as well was great for me. And what, what benefits do you think that the Manuela programme brought to students in their own personal lives? Um, I think for students, it's not being afraid to have the conversations. And um, that was one thing I experienced um, and also, as I said, to encourage them to have those conversations at home, to have them with friends, to alleviate any misconceptions or any misinformation that they may have had with regards to consent in a very 
simplistic way and not too in your face. Like it, it's done very subtly through the program, um, which I think is, is really, really important. It's the engagement of the, the case study scenarios, the impact of the media and um, the actual Lucy's house party and that film as well really emphasizes the difference in terms of consent as well. Absolutely. And do you think that the Manuela Riedo program was a good idea to implement into schools? Absolutely. I think it's it's extremely valuable um, and I'm very passionate about it. Um, and even for me personally, you know, when you say to someone that you're teaching uh, the Manuela program and they ask you what it's about, it has personally for me opened up a lot of conversations as well uh, with regards to informing people about things that I've learned from the program. Um, and I think any school that delivers it and introduces it to the curriculum is is adding to society because we're informing people about the difference between what's right and wrong, um, which hadn't been done in the past because it was a conversation that was avoided. So I think anyone that's in a position to be able to add it, um, and I suppose timetabling wise, you know, it is, is something that we've spoke about here as well. And it, it can be easy to remove it from the timetable, but if you believe in a program, you're not going to remove it. And, and I think that's the, the mentality here is that it's so important and it's so valuable to our school and to our students that we fight to keep it on the curriculum. Hi, I'm Matthew. Hi, I'm Matthew Colgan. I'm currently a six year student in Claude de Eamon Reich, Wexford. And when I was in TY, I undertook the Manuela Riedo program. Matthew, um, what do you think was your personal experience of undertaking the Manuela program? Um, personally, I think that it was a fantastic program. Um, I, d I personally definitely learned a lot um, and a lot of things that I probably wouldn't have learned on my own. Um, even just talking to friends and family, I, I, like, I don't think I would have learned what I learned during the Manuela program. Um, and I think a lot of the lads that took it with me and from other students that I know, um, they definitely learned a lot that they probably wouldn't have learned at home or in school generally. And I think, you know, as TYs and as a TY, I think it, it allowed me to develop more personally, um, uh, or especially like, you know, discussing topics around uh, positive sexual health and positive relationships and consent and everything that's in the programme. And do you feel that that conversation or that um, discussion with you and friends would have happened if it wasn't for the programme? Um, I definitely think it wouldn't have happened as smoothly. Um, you know, as, you know, hormonal teenagers, we kind of naturally, awkwardly uh, navigate through things. But I think the Manuela programme, it definitely handed us the tools and educated us on how to start these conversations especially with you know friends and family and you know saying look and I don't think this is right or do you think this is how I should do it or whatever it is um it definitely handed us the tools to do it less awkwardly and more you know run and smooth and what about misconceptions or misinformation that you may have had before the program do you feel like the program eliminated some of that absolutely um, I think that we did, we learned how, you know, the media uh, misconstrues a lot of the truth around um, sexual health and consent um, and that, you know, all around Irish law that we definitely had a fantastic understanding of what is right and what is not right. Um, so I think it is handed us the tools to, to say, like, to look at the media or look at different, you know, situations and say, well, actually, that's not that's not right. And if we're handed a, a misconception, we'll say, no, actually, this is the, what the Irish law says, or this is what um, the Manuela Riedo program says. So it's about informing yourself as opposed to just taking someone else's word for it. Absolutely. Um, like the Manuela program has definitely informed anybody that has taken it into how to how to spot these misconceptions and how to educate their peers on it as well you know as well as educating themselves and um, which is also a very important aspect is that it's allowing you as somebody who has undertaken the program to educate your peers somebody who hasn't taken the program
Um, and from your perspective, what do you feel were the main benefits for you personally and also for other students that were in your TY class? I think definitely, as I mentioned before, um, giving us the tools to be able to have these conversations without it being awkward or, you know, you know, normal teenage hormonal stuff getting in the way. It's, it's handed us the tools to have those conversations. It's, it's educated us on the fact that um, that there is, you know, terrible things that happen when consent is not in play and that have happened and that are still unfortunately happening um, and how to spot them and how to stop them before it happens um, and what is the right procedure as such in going around consent and sexual health and positive sexual health, especially in a, in a, in a man's point of view, it, it is very important because typically we don't have these conversations as, as men and as, as fellas in school, like we don't, we don't talk about these things. So it's, it's allowed us to open up and say like, is this okay? Because, you know, a lot of the time that that's not what happened. Okay. And um, do you feel that the Manuela program is a valuable addition to school curriculum? Um, I, I definitely do. And I definitely say absolutely. Um, before the Manuela Riedo program was implemented in, in my school, um, it, it, you know, you wouldn't talk about sexual health or consent in as much detail as we did during the program. Um, and I think it definitely uh, helped, helped us out a little bit because having that conversation is something that was really, really important and learning in depth and about problems that happened and problems that, uh, and issues and terrible things that had happened in the past because we weren't educated and there was a lot of Irish people who were not educated um, and hence the Moella Rado program was created. Um, so I, I definitely do think that it is something that should be implemented all over. Well, I hope at this stage, um everybody has had the chance to get a feel of the project and understand a bit more about what actually happened in the course of the Manuela project and the Manuela program itself, the, the substantive content and process around the education um, component. So it's now time to hear a bit more about the evaluation process and outcomes. One of the key criteria for the particular EU funding stream that, that supported this, this piece of work was the generation of evidence in evidence and, and the use of evidence informed approaches. Another was a focus on behaviour change. And this this is uh, was actually something that I think resonated with us in Tusla. Um, where the our interest I suppose is is not about in in the evaluation is not about you know a, a league table of programs. We know there's an awful lot of good work goes on in, in various shapes and forms around consent. Um, I suppose it was the idea that we'd actually find, be able to find out a bit about what actually works, you know, that that the things that that feel good and that seem positive, you know, what what is what is it that can we can we get some nuggets out of to learn about what's actually happening in through the process? We know, for example, that the project in its or the program in its current format isn't sustainable. That you know there would need to be changes, but it was to try and understand. Which, which bits do you hang on to? Which bits do you take forward? How do you reshape it? All, all of those things. And, and that's what we really want to take forward out of the project. So a team from NUI Galway, as has been said before, led by Dr. Porig McNeila, and were commissioned to undertake a very substantial evaluation. Uh, the evaluation, I think it's fair to say, was not without its challenges, challenges for everyone concerned, um, particularly in the context of getting real world evidence about a very comprehensive programme that's been delivered in a busy school environment. And, and I hope that the previous segments kind of gave a little bit of a feel of that. Um, the practical logistics around school timetables, the rhythm of the school year and sensitivities, you know, all factor in when you're trying to evaluate a piece of work. So we're incredibly grateful to Paul Drake and Dr. Maureen Death um, for the attention that they gave to this work and the quality of what they produced um, and also for their willingness to work with us around what was needed. 
The end result is a very rich, detailed and a nuanced piece of work uh, that involved a very substantive sample um, size of 700 out of the to total cohort of students. Um, so as, as Bernard referenced at the, at the beginning, I think that it's a really important body um, of work to, to be able to produce. So I would bring in Paul McNeil at this point, um, his input to tell us more about that. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to present on the independent research evaluation of the Manuela program uh, that we carried out. Uh, the two main researchers involved were myself and Maureen Diath as the postdoctoral researcher. And uh, you can see some of the other uh, people who took part, mainly from the active consent research team at the School of Psychology at NUI Galway. I'm going to talk to you about the evaluation uh, in four parts. The research background and methodology, which is a description of what we did and why. Uh, the key findings that emerged, particularly focusing uh, on, on the students, but also bringing in stakeholder perspectives as it's critical to look at the context in which the program is delivered with respect to sustainability and future development and scaling up. And in light of that, we conclude then with some points on recommendations. There is a very extensive research uh, report that goes with the evaluation and all of the points that I'm referring to are covered in, in a lot more detail there. I'm gonna start with the uh, overview of the uh, project. So the Manuela program, uh, was an ambitious pilot project uh, that was designed to uh, create a, uh, an engaging curriculum on consent and sexual violence uh, to be implemented across uh, four regions across the country and that, to explore the capacity building uh, for teachers uh, for sustainability of, of the program into the future. And when we assessed initially the manual and material for the program, we could see that it was based on uh, very strong theoretical foundations and that these were also reflected in the themes that we see in holistic sex education, uh, best practice research internationally, where the program was engaging people, uh, it was encouraging people and challenging people to think for themselves uh, seeing these aspects of consent sexual violence as life skills uh, and directly targeting gender inequality. Uh, the program involved a significant investment of time. So uh, while this presents challenges, it, it, it is also associated with uh, having a significant impact. Um, and this we could also see in, in terms of comparing with programs on sexual violence and harassment internationally. Um, where there were some comparisons to be sure, uh, much less so though in respect to the consent education that's included in the Manuela program, um, where really the examples there, we would be drawing on the college setting, uh, areas that we're quite familiar with in, in our area of research. And indeed, like those are the areas that we would draw on for the outcomes, measures and questionnaires that had to be adapted to the the school setting. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the evaluation design. Uh, this was really uh, intending to get at, is the program effective? Does it work in terms of changing attitudes, at least in the, in the short term? Uh, but then also, is it acceptable? Was it acceptable to students to take part in this uh, in terms of engagement and the experience? And is it sustainable? Was it being delivered in such a way as you could see it happening into the future and being scaled up into the future as well? So we assess this primarily on the statistical side through baseline and outcome assessment, a pre-post program survey that used standardized measures. And on the process and context, we involved qualitative research and stakeholder interviews uh, and focus groups. So the outcomes measurement then maps onto the learning outcomes and basically into two categories. Again, the enhancement and the increase in positive uh, autonomy, feeling of empowerment, which is uh, conducive to respectful mutual approach to sexual intimacy and uh, empowering people uh, to counter uh, 
the attitudes that contribute to and help perpetuate sexual misconduct and violence. The broader picture for the Manuela program is in terms of the opportunities and threats. So with respect to opportunities, we can see that both in terms of the changes with the well-being curriculum for junior cycle and the RSE reform being led by the NCCA, this presents significant opportunities for a program of this nature uh, in, in order to find a, a niche and a home within these changes in the curriculum, which very much favor the introduction of uh, strong structured research evidence programs that could involve transfer of knowledge to uh, teaching staff and building a capacity with the appropriate supports. Uh, also, it's evident that consent education is becoming increasingly <clears throat> uh, a hallmark of uh, uh, forward-looking sexual health education at the present time. And that involves, as I've said before, both growth-orientated aspects of sexual health, along with uh, promoting harm avoidance and preventative aspects of, of sexual health. And the opportunity that's presented through the partnership of Rape Crisis Centres and TUSLA, along with all of the other agencies with which they are linked, uh, clearly presents a, a very significant opportunity. Some of these can be turned on their head, though, and seen as threats uh, that obviously have been thought through to some extent and responses put in place or planned for the future. So the more you scale up, uh, the greater the propensity for lack of fidelity to the original program and monitoring. Uh, so what is said on paper, is it actually being translated into the uh, delivery of the, of the program in practice? Um, adaptation of the program in terms of length and complexity could also figure there with respect to uh, promoting fidelity. Uh, as it's a program for young people, it needs to be credible and so the continuous ongoing review and updating of content and methods is very advisable in that case. The topics that are covered are sometimes highly sensitive and so require extensive support and training of teachers. And those teachers themselves need to be, feel well supported within that role and that there's a whole of school approach, that we're not just seeing this as an island of activity, but it's reflecting the current of the trend of what's happening with respect to policy board of management, uh, endorsement, and uh, awareness of teaching staff right throughout the school. Uh, looking at the key measured outcomes, how we put into operation then some of those factors that I'm talking about. Um, we're looking at measures of sexual consent, self-efficacy, behavioral intentions for using verbal consent, asking uh, someone, giving permission, uh, in, we're looking for lower scores on passive consent, allowing somebody to do something to you. Uh, we're also looking for reductions in rape myth endorsement, heteronormative endorsement of traditional gender scripts, and also more balanced, nuanced understanding of, of pornography and, uh, and sexting as well. Uh, with respect to the participants who took part in the evaluation, we were mainly concerned with the uh, 707 students who took part in the research evaluation. So that was 626 students evenly split across gender who took part in the Manuela program and then 81 students who were in a control group who, who were later in, uh, got exposure to the Manuela program. And these were taken from a much broader group of 2,700 young people who took part in the pilot program over, over that period of time. Uh, with respect to our qualitative strategy, we employ participatory focus groups. So these are focus groups that involve uh, an applied focus, activities and tasks that are completed, and they allow students to reflect back on their experience of the program once it was completed. And then we carried out interviews and focus groups with teaching staff, with stakeholders, the project advisory group, and we're steered overall by the research advisory group for the, for the program. Uh, in, a, in a way, the study that we did uh, in itself, the pre-program survey provides us with some very interesting uh, uh, information in its own right, because it's probably one of the most substantial snapshots on young people, on teenagers and their endorsement of uh, sexual consent measures, but also rape myths. I've just pulled out here uh, some examples for male students on their endorsement of rape myths. 
uh, uh, on some of the items is illustrative of the other items that we included in that questionnaire. What we can notice here is that there is before the program has begun, there is endorsement or agreement of these rape myths by up to 30% of, of the young uh, male students who took part. Um, those are our critical target group uh, to connect with, engage with them and help them understand the nature of uh, a misinformed rape myth. But there's also a very significant number of students who gave neutral responses. And that's interesting too. So if we add the two together, we're getting up to 50% or even in some cases more than 50% of students who do not disagree, do not disavow those rape myth beliefs uh, that we really want to target. So that in itself is, is demonstrating the need for uh, the Manuela program and an intervention of this kind. Uh, then when we compare those pre-program survey responses with post-program survey responses, we saw that there were significant positive changes that were specific to the Manuela program participants. We did not see those changes in the control group responses. And we saw significant, statistically significant changes on the rating scales that I've introduced on almost all the measures, and in particular around consent preparedness, which is the positive self-efficacy, uh, knowledge and skills, perceptions of peers, and rape myth endorsement. So that's interesting because it's showing us both the increase in the positive capacity and also in enhanced questioning and rejection of some of the negative uh, beliefs that can help to perpetuate sexual violence. I want to show you some of the highlights in the statistical findings. I'm just going to take a look at some of the mean score changes. So this is just underscoring the types of changes that we found in the survey responses between the pre-program and post-program uh, survey. So for example, the female scores going on the consent preparedness scores, we want to see higher scores emerge there. And we saw scores go from 21.6 to 25.1. Difference for male students, still significant, maybe not quite as great. Then the increase in mean verbal consent behavioral intentions. This is the increase in the extent to which people say, I would ask, I would talk to my partner uh, in, in order to initiate um, uh, intimacy. A significant increase there for, for females and, and also for male students. As I said, we didn't see a significant change in the passive endorsement of passive consent as a communication style. But we did see a, a quite a large decrease in perceived barriers to consent. So that's what perceived behavioral control refers to. Uh, so the female scores went down quite significantly there and also the male scores as well. So that's uh, barriers, worries, concerns, embarrassment, uh, social uh, concern and stigma in connection with active uh, consent. Then in terms of the kind of critical scale that we had with respect to sexual violence and harassment, that was the rape myth scale. And the scores for female students went down quite significantly there and uh, also for males as well. Although you'll note that the baseline for male students was considerably higher at 58 than for females at 42. And so while it falls, it's still above, remains above the mean score for females. And the heterosexual script, which endorses beliefs around uh, guys should be the ones to ask girls out. Uh, it's a, uh, guys are going to be there to protect girls and so forth. Those heterosexual script beliefs, they were also uh, decreased by the end of the program. Here's some illustrative questions. Another way we can look at that, and you'll see this in the report, is by uh, looking at the statistical results and then just by looking at percentages. It's a descriptive way. It's quite helpful just to get a sense of changes that we can note in the, in the score. So for example, at the pre-program survey, 14% of female students strongly agreed, I have all the skills to deal with sexual consent. Uh, in the post-program survey, the percentage went up to 58%. Uh, that's what's behind that, that mean score difference. Uh, also, it's quite a significant change there for male students too. So very healthy, strong changes in perceptions of skills and feeling well-informed. It parallels what we see for consent uh, for college students who take part in consent workshops. 
And over on the other side of the slide, you can see some of the negative beliefs where we don't want people to agree with uh, the premise for the question. For example, if a girl initiates kissing or hooking up, she shouldn't be surprised if a guy assumes she wants to have sex. So we moved from a position at the beginning of the program where 42% of male students agreed with that idea and at the end of the program, we're down to 22%. As I noted earlier, though, we still have large numbers of students who are in the, the neutral category and still need to be uh, uh, supported in terms of attitude change. With respect to the program components themselves, the process of the program was perceived quite positively. So all six sessions were rated positively. The program facilitators are rated very positively, and often this is a reference to the project workers themselves who are seen as experts, as very well accomplished in the delivery of this. Um, there was more mixed opinions about uh, teachers. For some students, they spoke about having a reservation that teachers would be involved at all, and it speaks to the level of, uh, again, ongoing development and support for teachers to be involved in delivery of a program of this nature. Uh, when they were asked to reflect on program impact, nearly all the students said that they could identify positive program impact, uh, that they were better able to understand the nature of sexual violence, to distinguish healthy from unhealthy relationships and so forth. But it is noteworthy, again, that male students consistently provided less positive feedback. They were less likely to say that the uh, components were positive. Uh, and they were less likely to say that there was a, a significant program impact. Um, so they lagged behind maybe by 10-15% on the, on the female students. The stakeholder perspectives uh, gave us a really interesting uh, uh, insight into the uh, future for the program in that all agreed that the program is valuable, is useful, it's coming into an emerging space for in a, that will reward and support innovative programs of this kind. Uh, it, it's taking place within an expansive network of interdisciplinary uh, expertise, but that there are future challenges. And most significantly, of course, people are pointing to the financial support required to scale up the sustainability. How will this work on a much larger scale? and questions around reviewing the scope and the, the length of the program is 12 hours uh, necessary in order to deliver on the, the learning that's, that's sought. The qualitative findings uh, here are spoken about in quite an extensive section of the report. Uh, they refer to the context, getting a really good understanding of where the students, the teachers, uh, the schools themselves are coming from. Uh, the uh, admonition that we put out there that you have to meet people where they are with respect to their previous uh, training, exposure to programming of this kind, and that really is going to, to inform the process, the nature of the delivery. But overwhelmingly, we could see positive experiences uh, emerging from the process for students. They enjoyed this program. Uh, the teacher spoke about the positive uh, experience they had in terms of delivery, uh, but also some concerns about whether they could do this without the, the, the project workers. That's a significant question mark. Um, and in terms of the future, maintaining the core values and the content of the program, continually refreshing it, uh, linking it, placing it maybe differently within the junior and senior cycle and the systems that would be needing to be engaged with in order to accomplish this uh, ambitious goal. Over on the other side of the slide, uh, you are able to see representative quotes from the students showing us, again, many of the positive points. There are some negative and challenging points raised about the program participation. They are covered in the report, but this is a good opportunity just to identify and note the uh, positive uh, feelings, the learning around empowerment again on the positive side uh, and, and also the empowerment around understanding better the nature of sexual violence, uh, questioning and challenging it and having a good sense of, of how to proceed there. The key recommendations I'm going to note uh, very briefly uh, in terms of content, the program content was largely supported by the evaluation. Uh, however, we have noted the, the need to review and update that content, particularly maybe bringing in more recent research evidence in certain areas, 
uh, and, and also very active input from young people would uh, unquestionably keep it on track to ensure that the activities are, are kept up to date and are honed down where necessary. In terms of the format itself, there would be a need maybe to look at the implications for format of delivery if there was a movement more towards the junior cycle, uh, but there should surely be a continuity between junior and senior cycles, a staged or spiral curriculum that would take students right throughout their uh, uh, educational experience in, in that sense. The delivery model is going to be challenging uh, in that there will be a continuing need for project worker input, uh, but that increasing numbers of teachers would be needed to scale up this program and to uh, engage with it on a wider scale. And just the nature of the ongoing support, um, accreditation uh, and so forth that will be required for teacher only delivery of the program. The delivery window, as I've mentioned, is a really critical issue that emerged uh, looking at the nature of rape myth, for example, and some other negative attitudes already being present by the time that we get to the TY uh, component of somebody's education and therefore uh, causing us to reflect and look back at earlier points in the junior cycle, for example, when programming of this type at an age appropriate way uh, could be brought in. Uh, and the overall training and education uh, really taps into student and teacher concerns, maybe from different perspectives, over teacher-based delivery uh, and the need to expand the training and education program for, for teachers and indeed to, to support a whole of school approach, we're going to need to see this uh, also having spin-off programs in terms of awareness for other teachers and staff, support with policy development, which is covered in a little bit of detail in the report for principals, boards of management, and indeed outreach to parents. And with the fidelity monitoring that I, I mentioned at the outset of this presentation, ongoing uh, evaluation and routine outcomes assessment, moving from the very complex survey instrument that we used uh, in the evaluation itself, all the way up to uh, a much more simple targeted tool for ongoing routine outcomes assessment. I'd really like to thank uh, everybody on the program team for the opportunity that we had to take part in this evaluation uh, and to conduct the independent research evaluation uh, coming from NUI Galway. It just had a very significant meaning that we were able to support the work that was begun by the Manuela Riedo Foundation and that we're so uh, pleased to be involved with as we see it expanding and reaching all corners of the co country, hopefully in the future. Thank you. Thanks to Podrick for that uh, very substantive um, input and lots to think about there, lots to get our heads around. Our next speaker uh, brings, I suppose, perspective from all sides of education around sexual consent. Um, Kathleen Connolly is director, executive director at the Galway Rape Crisis Centre, and Kathy and her team are at the coalface when things go wrong around sexual consent. Galway Rape Crisis Centre has a lot of experience dealing with young people amongst their service users, and like other rape crisis centres, have a long-standing focus on education and training within schools and the wider community for, for years. Um, Kathy, Amanda Cosgrove and Michelle Caulfield, along with other colleagues at Galway Rape Crisis Centre, have been unfailing champions and supporters for the Manuela Project. Um, when the project needed a lead within the Rape Crisis Centre sector, um, Galway put up their hands um, and a ton of unseen work went along with this. Uh, so in Thusa, we're very grateful for that. Uh, Cathy and her colleagues have contributed at all levels in the thinking, planning, doing of the project and, and beyond. So um, over to Cathy now. Hello, my name is Cathy Connolly and I'm the Executive Director of the Galway Rape Crisis Centre. I'm happy to be part of the launch of the final evaluation report on the Manuela Riedo programme. Currently, there is a great deal of talk about consent education, and that's very important because consent education helps to challenge the attitudes and behaviour that are likely to lead to sexual violence. And so we can use it as a very positive educational tool. 
The Manuela Rieda programme really began with collaboration between all 16 rape crisis centres and the Manuela Rieda Foundation. And in turn, this led to a further collaboration between all the centres, the Manuela Rieda Foundation and Tusla. Based in Galway, we've always had a very special place in our hearts because of Manuela's memory and because of our connection with the Manuela Rieda Foundation. And Michelle, one of the project workers that you heard from earlier, continues to work here in Galway Crisis Centre as a therapist and an educator. And I'd like just to say thanks to Michelle and Kevin and Christy and Carolyn, the four project workers, without whose commitment and work, this whole programme would never have happened. They were just unbelievably hardworking and went above and beyond anything they had to do. I remember back in 2016 with Owen and with Michelle presenting the programme to Anne Ryan and to Mary Roach of Tusla to see if there was some way we could work out how we could roll out this programme around the country to the very, to schools all over the country. And using the knowledge and the expertise that was based in all 16 centres, recognising that and trying to formulate it into some sort of programme. And out of that came the application to the EU and the money came from the EU, but also help and support came in abundance from Joan Mullen, from Mary Roach and from Anne Ryan and Tusla. And without them, we couldn't have progressed it. We became beneficial partners with Tusla and applied for the funding to the EU. And I speak now as chair of the RCC Forum, which represents nine of the RCCs in the country. We in the sexual violence sector would like to every student in Ireland to have access to this programme. We can offer this, we can also offer this through mentoring and through our own experience and expertise in the area. And now I'm talking about next steps, as we are hopeful that we will have an opportunity to apply for extra EU funding. Since the project ended in March of this year, we, we started a new application almost immediately for follow-up funding so that the project can begin again where it finished. We've agreed to remain involved in GRCC and this time Pave Point have agreed to become part of as have agreed to become part of the project. As the beneficial partners, if I knew now what I did, if I knew then at least what I know now, I think we would have run away because we had no idea of the challenge it would prove. But it turned out because of the collaboration and the hard work that everybody put into it, it worked out very well. And really, it, that was down to one person in our organisation, our project administrator, Amanda Cosgrave, for her unflinching support and work because she was determined to see it through. Um, the EU funding is a vital part in this work. And there, are some, there were some hairy moments, but we overcame everything because we collaborated. And I think that's a very key word. And it was easy to do that because we share a basic belief in the programme and the importance of the programme in the lives of young people. What was very interesting was that schools welcomed our project workers with open arms and they acknowledged their expertise and the depth of their knowledge and also the content of the programme. This, the learning from the programme has been acknowledged in the review done by NUIG and I'd like to thank Porik and his colleague Maureen and all the others in NUIG who have worked on the review. Um, there is no doubt that we need to continue to test the material and our ultimate goal in working on the programme is to have the Manuela programme embedded in our education system and part of the curriculum and sexual violence. We, and I now speak as chair of the RCC Forum, which represents nine of the RCCs, we in the sexual violence sector would like every student to have access to the Manuela programme. We can offer this by helping with our own mentoring, training or lending our own expertise. I'm talking about next steps as we are hopeful that we will be able to continue to further to, to gain further funding from the EU. When the Manuela programme finished in March of this year, we with our colleagues in Tusla immediately started to apply for a further funding application. We've agreed in GRCC to remain part of the new programme and have a point of come on board as potential new partners, which is very exciting. The new iteration of the programme will enable us to look at how the programme can be targeted to meet the needs of particular young people or particularly disadvantaged groups. 
and this is a very exciting development in the programme. Again, collaboration will be very important moving forward. The application is currently moving through the process, through this elusive EU portal, which Amanda is working on, so I, I'm leaving it to her to figure it out. If we succeed, it will afford us an opportunity to build on the Manuela programme. There's a huge in interest in consent education. Young people deserve to have the best education we have to offer. So I hope we get the opportunity to get this funding and to further the programme. We would, of course, be very happy to take funding from any other source, be that statutory or philanthropic. And during this strange time of COVID-19, it is great to have a reason to be hopeful that another round of funding will come our way and that we'll be able to continue the collaborative work that we're doing. So I wish everybody good luck and thank you. Thanks to Cathy for that input. Um, I Just a few things. We're, we're very conscious that the time has run over a little bit. Um, so for anybody who is interested to be around for the questions and answers section, um, just if, if you have the time to stay on a little bit longer, um, we have some questions coming in, so please feel free to add to any questions that are being put in. Um, and if there, if there are questions that don't get picked up today, we can, we can come back on, on those later. Um, just there was a question, one practical question came in about if people had missed part of this, um, can, will it be recorded? So it will be available later. We'll have it on the LUSA website and there's a live feed for, for a period of time after the after this, this live session. So um, with that, I suppose we're going to move on just to, to spend a, a, just a, a short amount of time just with, um, to ask Owen Durkin, who is from the Manuela Riedo Foundation of Ireland, um, who, you know, and we've, we've talked a lot about the Manuela legacy and, and the remembrance, um, and the remembrance both of Manuela Riedo and the, the sadness, um, of for for her, her and her family and and the but the importance of of the impact of her her death um on a community so we I suppose just want to reflect a little on the significance of the project and its or origins um and I, I think various people have have talked about a little bit about the story and the connection with the Manuela Riedo Foundation and and Tusla. Um, and the Red Crisis Centre. So I, th I think that bit of the story has been kind of t told. Um, so in this little bit, I suppose one of the things that struck me was just at the time was that the, with the work that had been done, that, that is the foundation, the Manuela programme, I suppose the people weren't looking for funding. They were looking for ideas and opportunities. You know, it, it really was about, ca can we make this matter? And that, that has really, really been such an important part of, of this whole process. Um, so I will go over to the, the segment with, with Owen, um, and this also includes uh, an input um, from Manuela Riedo's parents, Mr and Mrs Riedo. Hello, my name is Owen Durkin, and it's a great honour to be able to speak on behalf of Manuela's parents, Arlette and Hans Peter. Who are watching in from their home in Switzerland this morning. They want to pass on their thanks, uh, their heartfelt thanks for all the people who have worked in this project over the last number of years. I also want to speak on behalf of the many, many former directors of the Manuela Riedo Foundation. I want to speak on behalf of the many Galwegians who really put their shoulder to the wheel and funded amazingly over the last nine or ten years so as that we could fund the initial parts of the Manuela programme. So today is a good day. And five years ago in Galway, this week, the 16 Red Price Centres of Ireland came together and they had faith in us on, under the umbrella of the Manuela Riedo Foundation to share their knowledge, to share their ideas, and they put much heart and thinking and professionalism into this project. So I'd like to thank you all. Following on from that with Sue Redmond's great facilitation, the project workers in the four regions through um, the Kerry, uh, Wexford, the Dublin, and particularly the Galway Rape Crisis Centres, they refined this programme and brought it to where it is today. So I want to thank you all most particularly. Um, I really need to thank Tusla. They put faith also in this project and they brought this project 
uh, with some initial funding from the Manuela uh, Project or the Manuela Foundation to Brussels. So I thanked Joan Mullen, uh, particularly Mary Roach, but most particularly Anne Ryan, who again were at the heart of this project and brought it again to where we are today. But I feel today is only a first step and we need to keep moving with this programme. So just to bring you back to why we are here today and who Manuela was, I hope you don't mind me just taking a few moments to reflect on her life. The body of a young woman was discovered just before half past nine this morning. Her remains were found on waste ground, just yards below the line along the lake shore of Lockett. On the 8th of October 2007, Arlette and Hans-Peter Riedo from Switzerland experienced every parent's nightmare. Their only child, 17-year-old Manuela, was raped and brutally murdered in Galway City just two days after she left her Swiss home for the first time. Manuela, Manuela, my mother's death in Galway 13 years ago shocked, repulsed and numbed a nation. This was a girl, a young girl, a young woman, who hoped and thought she was coming to a safe place, an idyllic place in the west of Ireland. On the second anniversary of Manuela's passing, a few Galwegians got together and said, what can we do? How can we kind of repair? How can we heal? How can we do just do something in kind of desperation? And after that came a gorgeous, gorgeous couple of nights and years of music and dance and song. And the healing started to begin and money started to be raised. And we had no idea where that money would go or who it was for, but we got advice. We looked around the landscape of a chaotic landscape of different services, different agencies. And all of a sudden, people started to raise more money and we got more focused about where it could be spent and how best it would be placed and how best we could honour the legacy of Manuela Riedo through prevention, education, awareness and healing. And people start to run for education, for prevention and for healing. They ran in Connemara, they ran in Dingle, they ran in Galway. Ordinary people, following on from ordinary artists and musicians, and people from Galway, people throughout the country who just wanted to do something. And then we celebrated and commemorated our life. But not only do we do that, we celebrated the work of people at the coal face, the people who are counselling and healing. But it became quickly apparent for us as a small charity in the west of Ireland that education was a real, real need. And we started to focus on kids of Manuel's age, 16, 17, 18, that didn't seem to be getting the advice or the education or the space to talk about sexual violence, consent and pornography within their school system. And out of that, we felt we'd had to focus our energies, our money and the hard-earned money uh, into those kids and into that system or into that model that would create something that could educate and prevent rather than heal. And out of that came the Manuela program. And also over the last few years, another group of creative and kind people thought that they might rebuild and rename a boat in Manuela's memory, and so they have. This boat has become a focus of further friendship and further healing and has further kind of knitted Hans, Peter and Arlette into the Galway community. Oh, okay. And if you're ever in Galway again after Covid and you look out on Galway Bay, look out for a boat with a significant green stripe and maybe on it you might see Hans, Peter and Arlette with other people that have become their family. 
So the hope is that over the next um, number of years, Manuela's Boat can be used as a place of healing and reflection, a place where people who work at the coalface of sexual violence in Ireland can get away for a while from the important and often underfunded and underappreciated work that they do. So at a celebration of the launch of Manuel's Boat some years ago in St. Nicholas's Church, um, Colin McAnumra played this piece of music called Sonasta in appreciation of the work of the Galway Rape Crisis Centre and the Sexual Assault Treatment Unit in Galway. So keep an eye out for the green stripe on Galway Bay. Manuel is with you and with the work that you do and you need to keep going with and against all the, the harsh and calm winds that you face in your work because it's important work. So out of the unimaginable tragedy of Manuela's brutal murder, some hope has come, some goodness has come. And the Manuela program symbolizes and embodies that hope and that goodness. It would be heartbreaking for this program to be left, uh, gather dust on a shelf in the Department of Education, in an office of the NCCA, in a classroom in our schools, or in a rape crisis centre. It needs to be honoured as Manuela's legacy. And I hope that all the stakeholders can come together now and move forward with this, are parts of this, and make it into the consent education and sexual violence education and pornography education that our kids in our schools deserve and need and are crying out for. So thank you again and thanks all for getting this to what it is today. So uh, I think moving and I think just underlying the, the importance of, of the issue um, that we're dealing with and just uh, good to have a little bit of time to remember Manuela there in, in such a vivid way. Um, we are opening up, I suppose, questions now. So to, just to recap um, on the, the total proceedings will go out on a Vimeo link to all of the participants. Um, and will be available for the next 48 hours and then after that on the THUSA website. So you'll, you'll get it if you've had an invite to the event. Um, we are, so we have a number of people who are available to take questions and we're conscious of time and, and as always with these things, the questions might get a little um, pushed, but we would like to just take a, a couple of questions um, at this stage. So we have a number of kind people who said they'd be available to take some questions. Um, we have Claire Williams, who's the manager of the Wexford Rape Crisis Centre. Paul Drake Mahila is, is available. Um, Kevin McParland and Michelle Caulfield, who were the project workers who were on the um, video earlier. Um, and we also have very kindly Annette Honan from the National Council for Curriculum Assessment, who was the lead on the RSE um, review piece of work that, that has been referenced, has also uh, made herself available. So we really appreciate that, Annette, um, and Mary Roach is available. So we have a number of questions already, and we might just take them. And with that, I think maybe because there's been so much talk and reference to the curriculum, and not to put you on the spot, Annette, as the starting bit, but I uh, could we ask, I suppose, would you have any comments around the, the questions that have come in around where does this fit with the um, the RSC curriculum? Um, and maybe I can even leave it just as, as open as that with, with some nuances on questions, but um, would you like to comment on that? Uh, thank you, Joan. Yes, I'd be happy to. I noticed two questions that perhaps could be taken together. One was, is it uh, anticipated that this programme would roll out into all schools? And the other is, should it be a standalone or integrated programme within what's already existing? And obviously, um, it would be most desirable to see a programme such as this, which is um, so badly needed, being uh, available to all schools, but also um, the best way to do that is to have it as an integrated part of the SPHE and RSE curriculum. So that therefore it's there for all children in all schools and not just for some. Now, clearly it needed to start in that way to, uh, to trial and test it out and to evaluate it. And the, um, the, the need for this and the impact of it is now so clear. Um, you couldn't but hope that it could now be integrated into um, a curriculum 
uh, that's available for all children. Um, Porik has already mentioned the fact that within the NCCA there's a significant review taking place in curriculum development, so the timing is really good. Um, we've got a primary review we've put, and a senior cycle review taking place, and in both of those the need for education in this area has been highlighted by parents, teachers, um, all stakeholders, and for us to do something that's um, much more relevant to the needs of young people. Um, so. I, I would be very hopeful that moving forward, we'll see a, a much more holistic, integrated curriculum of which consent will be a core part of it from early childhood right across into senior cycle. And in the meantime, while that curriculum is being developed, um, I would also hope to see that this programme could continue in transition year, where at the moment schools have huge flexibility. They don't need permission to do this. Uh, they design their own curriculum within transition year. Uh, so, uh, it's already, obviously, there's a programme there that has worked has worked well with these students and um, so that schools can opt in and, and and hopefully with support but the key thing that's needed with the best curriculum in the world um is going to need confident and competent teachers at to go into classrooms and to be able to work with students in this sensitive area and this has been already referred to so that's where i think a really a multi-agency approach is needed where we can bring all of the expertise together from the organizations whether it's in the formal education sector the non-formal um, and to see how we can scale up and support teachers and increase capacity so that we have teachers who are capable of bringing this because in terms of scaling it up unless teachers are confident um, it, it's not really going to be scalable. So that would be my hope as well, that we could work on an interagency basis to see how we can um, support enhanced uh, professional development of teachers in this area. Thanks, Annette. I think that's, that's a very comprehensive answer there. And, and I think it's really important to have that, that kind of perspective from the education sector coming in. Um, I've two questions that, that are kind of on a, on a theme maybe that we might pick up um, a question from Nolene Blackwell um, around the whether the program is particularly suitable for vulnerable young people and for example traveler young people um, and there's another it was another question from Sarah about accessing schools and education um, you know people who are young people who are not in education so I, I I'm just wondering perhaps some of the Kevin or Michelle maybe who've been directly involved in the project if you want to comment on that just from your experience and um, if there's anybody else who wants who has something to say on that but I think they're they're important questions yeah just to pick up on that Joan thank you um I guess the programme was designed in such a way as to be appropriate and applicable both in formal and non-formal educa se education settings. Um, in terms of how the programme ultimately was delivered, we did have a number of youth workers who participated in our facilitation training days. And we also did roll out the programme to a number of youth reach centres. Myself, I delivered in Ballymon and Cabra youth reach centres where again, we had a variety in terms of even, you know, young people who are over the age of 18 who are returning to education, participating in the programme. And again, I know that the experiences from one of those um, ed youth reach centres was captured in um, the report that NUIG did as well. As regards the question on rolling out to other um, communities and other youth groups i think maybe you know mary might be best positioned to talk about that i know that kathy mentioned the possibility of rolling out in future to Pavi point so i don't know if mary would like to elaborate on that a little bit perhaps um, just checking i'm not sure if there if if maybe the sound might be good are you coming in on that mary I'm if 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 I'm in, I'd be happy to pick it up. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a very good point uh, from Nolene. The, the the question about is is it possible to use this program uh, with in a more targeted way with particular groups? I th I think that's going to be essential, and I think that would form a very important uh, test ground uh, in the new uh, in the new application, the new project that we're hoping will get funded. Um, there is a very specific piece of that project that is about creating the materials directly uh, bespoke materials for um, ethnic minority groups travelers in particular along with 
with them themselves and with Pave Point, their lead organization. So we'd be very excited about making this uh, work in, in, a, in, a, in a more bespoke way or, or in a more targeted way. Okay, thanks, thanks for that. Thanks for that. And if I might just um, put, there's a couple of questions that I think, Padraig, you will be definitely the person to answer these. Um, so statistical scores from, from your report, um, I suppose, they just a technical question or whether their scores are mean or out of 100%. Um, now, if, if it's not something that can be taken up here, we can send a response to that later, just if we might need to tease it out. And there was just a question around the, the rape myth acceptance measurement scale, scales that were used and whether there's, whether there's any plans for further work in, in this area um, in the long term. I can unmute myself first of all and uh, just just address that briefly so uh yeah just in the presentation today and in the report there's a very extensive research report that you can you can get all the kind of details and what we do we work when we're looking at the significance of change between groups and so forth um then we're looking at like mean changes but like in presenting the results today, then we've just adopted a, a various formats there. We're talking about mean scores, sometimes just taking individual items and just illustrating for you the way in which the percentage of students who agree or disagree with a certain item, uh, the degree to which that changes over time, that's very accessible, I think, for 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 people to hear. So we've 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 used those different formats in the in the presentation today um in terms of the rape myth acceptance uh, scores i think they're a really interesting baseline to keep an eye on and you know uh, really the format of sampling that took place with the evaluation meant you you kind of got full coverage really of of a particular class so it wasn't so much like an element of self selection of young people who who chose to take part or chose not to take part so i think it's a really strong baseline to come back to uh over time and i i could i could see the parallel to the work that we've been doing in universities where we've used the same measures in some cases and our intention would be again like in the university area to kind of come back to that in a couple of years to see what the change has been on the baseline and I think that's one important kind of spin off from the Manuela uh, research is that you could equally do that with a school age population. Um, and this was one of the main things I think that put uh, uh, made it quite evident, really, that maybe lo looking at a younger age group would be very important because of the degree to which the rape myth acceptance was already kind of fairly solidified. Um, and again, like that doesn't necessarily mean that young people are thinking consciously about that, but it's it's maybe an indication of the media or the socialization that they're exposed to. Uh, the program then causes them to think critically about some of these attitudes. And as we saw for most of them, I think we saw uh, important changes downward, but we still saw that we're hanging on to that gender difference and young male students in particular uh, having higher scores than than female students. So again, I think our approach is similar to what's used with the Manuela program, is to meet people where they are and help them understand where those attitudes are coming from. Um, uh, but I, again, I think it's very exciting possibility of that continuous thread now in knowledge between the transition year students that, that we surveyed and later on in terms of college students. And it would be very interesting to see how that develops over the next few years. Thanks, thanks for that, Padraig. And thanks to everybody who's on the panel. I'm just very conscious of time at this stage. So I think we, we do have a number of other questions. Um, we, uh, so I think we better um, round up and we won't get to them. So apologies if your question hasn't been picked up. I think we'll have a look and anything that we can add in terms of just sending on it, anything that we can respond to, we'll, we'll do that to follow up. Um, so just finally, um, it's left to me to round up to, I suppose, say we i think we've we've hopefully name checked and caught most everybody um that's involved or most people that were involved in the project to date so just to say really the grateful acknowledgement of all of the the moving parts that have made this work 
um, across statutory and non-statutory partners. Um, thanks to everyone who's joined us this morning for your time and for people who are still with us for, for bearing with us for the extra time. Um, we just thanks to everybody who contributed an input in the session um, they and our Q&A panel. Um, thanks to everyone who's involved in organising the event, our own team, Mary, Anne, Anita, Connor and Janice from comms and thanks to the focus fast forward productions for I suppose for making it easy for us today. So um, good wishes and hopefully we'll you'll hear more about this again. Bye now, thanks.